uh, specifically? In other words, are you selling the coaches, the facilities, the, the growth of the program over the last all two years? I, I think it's all important because, you know, they all want to know, all right, like I said, who, who can help me become a better person? I think you sell player, I mean, personal development over athletic development first. I think where, you know, and, and as is my son, where, where can my young man develop as a person? I mean, the ball's going, he, he loves ball. I know he's going to work. I know he's going to work on that. But where does he get developed as a person? Who reinforces the values, accountability, dependability, learning how to make choices in life, then the academics, then the ball, and then life after ball? And I think that's where you know, being in the state capitol and being here and people know you, the name recognition, having the media that we have here in the state capitol is a huge, it's a huge advantage that nobody else has in Florida because we have every media outlet always represented almost daily at our practices, our scrimmages, and everything that goes on. So, I mean, there's a, you can develop the complete person, not just the player. The player's going to take care of itself. Then you look at the rich tradition of Florida State, the history of it, the players have been here, where it's going, the direction we're trying to take it. I mean, it kind of, you know, it sells itself, and then you, you build that personal relationship. Hey, Jimbo, at some point, did you, uh, did victories over Miami, Florida, bowl game victory, Tim, at every step of the way, did you sense that having an effect over kids who are still undecided? I don't think it hurt. A lot, most of our class was probably even done before we beat Miami. If you go back and look at it, a large majority of it, but it didn't hurt as it went and it snowballed, and I think it really solidified to a lot of guys where we were going and how we were getting there. Think I, I think press, it helped. Do you think it'll press next year's seniors? I don't think it hurts. I really don't. Or but I'm going to tell, tell you this. I, I'm a believer in this in, in kids today. I think kids today are much more interested. That I think that has a huge impact. I think kids are more interested today. How can I, where, how can I play immediately? Where can I fit in and who can help me get to where I want to go? I think that applies in more, more than us beating Miami or us beating Florida. I think because that's our society. Instant gratification right now. Hey, you mentioned yesterday on TV and me did that um, the coaching changes in Miami and Florida, bigger impact on next year's class because of the, the relationships. I'm curious, when you got here, how long did it take you to catch up to what Urban was doing down there and others? You know, uh, myself not being the head coach, it was a little different. You know what I'm saying? I came in that first class, we came in offensively, I know. I mean, it was hard. I mean, you had to try to flip some guys and get back in it. And then after that first year, we started building those relationships. But I'd already had relationships in Florida, and some of our guy, our coaches had too. But probably a year, year and a half or so as it got going, I would say. The receiver, you guys, you talked about recruiting before you have a need. I mean, obviously, the receiver's a position where you have a lot of guys coming back. It's not like you have a glaring need there. Talk about how convincing Kelvin and you know, I'm excited about those two guys. I mean, you, you're talking about guys that complement each other. You're talking about Rashad Green, extremely fast. I mean, probably high four threes on vertical, about 40 inches. Uh, but then at the same time, very polished. Come out of the great program, great route runner, excellent hands, and a return guy. So you come up with that. And then on the other side, you got a guy's probably 6'5", 6'5 and a half, 242 pounds. Benjamin's 242. Not 215, he's 242. He's got ball skills that are phenomenal, and he runs routes like he's 5'10", 180. And when he wants to compete, you can do whatever you want to do. He's going to do what he wants to do. He's, he's a player, and you know, he's got to take that to our level and do it. But I think he's, I think he's very special. And those two guys, because I'm going to believe this, the game has changed. We've got to have those big guys inside, but when you get guys outside that they're scared to play one-on-one, -on -one, the game becomes fun. And if they do, you can take advantage of it. It becomes a fun football game. Because they can't play one-on-one, -on -one, you can do whatever you want to do. And if they have to play two-on-one, -on -one, that means you can run the football and get the ball to tight ends. That's where Nick O'Leary and those guys all fall into our, our deal. And they'll run the football. And be very physical inside and, and controlling the numbers in the box. And you got to have those guys they fear that can hit the home run. And both those guys can. How good is Carlos Woods? Good question. I think Carlos is one of those unique guys that comes around about every 10 or 15 years. I don't mean to put pressure on him and, and how he plays and when he gets here and how he develops, that's one thing. But talent-wise, he's not the 6'2", 218-pound guy that's going to move to linebacker because he has great top end speeds, 10'7", electronic, and 100 meters, and he has tremendous ball skills. You go watch his film, he plays the ball in the deep part of the field, which a lot of those guys can't do that are big safeties. He can get to the ball, he can cover ground off the half because of the great speed, and he has tremendous ball skills. And you watch him on offense on his tape, catching balls down the field, catching bubbles, running, and then you watch his film at tailback. I mean, I think he could be a top five tailback in the country if he really wanted to be when you really watch it. I mean, I think he's one of those unique guys that's very special. Now, how he plays and how he learns and all that, he's a very smart guy. We'll see. But I'm very excited about it. I think he's 
I think, are very unique. So you have those three guys from St. Thomas Aquinas, and just talk about that, and then what that does for you in the future with a big-time program like that, continue to get guys out of there. Well, if your kids come over and they continue to have success and they understand what you're trying to do, and you, and you get a foothold in there, that because the kids at St. Thomas Aquinas understand one thing. They understand the future, they understand how to work, and they understand winning. And they understand what it takes to win and all the things you got to do in the offseason. And they've been disciplined, and there's just a uniqueness to them that you don't have to go through and teach the process of all the Now, how you do what you do, but they get it. Okay, we're going to do it like this because this is what happens. And they're used to getting that. And they understand that whole process, and then they're very well coached. They're very well developed, and uh, it's a tremendous program. I mean, arguably, you could argue there's as good a high school as there is in the country. I mean, there's a lot of them out there, but they can, they can hold a candle to anybody. Two, what? Two of the last three national championships in high school ball. And, and if the kids here keep having success and seeing that we do things very similar to them as far as the way we develop, because they develop the kid, they're all good students, and they, and they turn to be athletes. Well, that's just what I just said we want to do. Now, if their kids come here and continue to do that, which the guys here are really having a lot of success, Andrew Datko's a St. Thomas guy, Lamarcus Jordan's doing very well, the three guys we just brought in. I mean, there's a lot of guys in that avenue, so it can't hurt you, that's for sure. Quick follow-up on Bobby Hart. Have you ever signed a 16-year-old before? It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Like George said, we were sitting there the other day, Coach Smith said, hey, I got freshmen at the same age as this guy. I mean, he got to have three more. He literally, logistically, if you want to go by Florida high school rules, he have three more years of high school. And should definitely have two. I mean, he's, going to, he's not going to turn 17 years old until the end of August after he's been through two days. And he's ready to play. Everybody thinks he's young and he's not ready. You're crazy. I, I think he really is. Now, we'll see how he develops when he gets here, but he can handle it. I mean, he's, he, he's, he's a very special guy. Tim, this was your first full cycle with the staff. Just talk about the staff and how they did. I'm very excited because you know why? The first thing they do, they're good people. They're all very good coaches. They've all had success at the highest levels you could have it at, but none of them think they invented it. They're good guys. They're guys you like to sit around, even if you're not at work with, enjoy, have a barbecue, sit around, talk. You enjoy being around. They're good people. And I think that's one of the keys to, to recruiting, that they're down-to-earth people who can build relationships and talk to folks. Then they have tremendous work ethic. They were willing to put in the hours and go at it. And that's not usually the case. Some guys like it but don't like the hours. Some guys like the hours, can't do the talking or can't get it across. They're, they're very unique and from top to bottom, they all can recruit, they all can coach. And uh, I'm very proud of them. They did a lot of hard work. And I like to say this is something about us. It helped our recruiting class, but none of us talk about it. You have coaches all the credit, Florida State all the credit. You know who should get a lot of credit? Our players. I say this all the time. You can recruit 364 days a year. Have the kid, the mom, the grandma, the sister, the girlfriend, whoever, have them all ready to sign. They come on, they, they can come here and have a bad time with the wrong kids. You know, and your kids selling your program and what goes on. And not saying that the coaches are fake or phony. And our kids did a tremendous job of selling our program and what we're doing. And uh, I think that's a huge part of the success we've had. Who is your best recruiter? Which player? Oh, there's a ton. I, I couldn't give you one. I mean, I'm serious. And, and here's the other thing. A lot of guys wanting to do it. Not guys that were running from it. Before I've been here and guys wanted, now nah, I'm going here this weekend. We, we had to turn some of them away. There's weekends we had to turn guys away of hosting players. And uh, they were anxious to go get other players on their team. And our attitude on the team, I think, is very good. Well, well, were you known for training years? for four years? Do what? Yeah, <laughs> you known for four years, it sounds yes. like. So you've been coming out of the eighth grade probably. The first uh -huh. week you attended one. At that time, I mean, is that type of kid you know then? You knew he definitely was going to be a player. It doesn't matter if he got big enough, but you saw the body. and you, you If he just kept on the stage and the, the development process he was on, you knew he was going to be a player. There, there was no doubt. Can you talk a little bit about Nick O'Leary and why it was important to wow. sign him for this class? Nick O'Leary is, you talk, you talk about a throwback guy now. I mean, when you can open up the middle of the field, like I said, when you have to double outside, that tight end becomes one-on-one -on -one inside and, he can, and can get vertical inside, he's maybe as instinctive a guy as in the whole class. Understands holes, understands things. You know, remember, he's a national MVP of the 707 tournament. With all those little water bug receivers running around all over the country. His team won it. He had more catches, more TDs than anybody in the national 707. Very athletic, very good hands, very good instincts, understands the game. You got to remember this. Last year on that team with, with, with all those guys that went to Florida, Elam and all those guys that great teams, you realize he was the punt returner at 235 pounds. Returned a couple punts back for touchdown. He was the punter on the team. He, was, he played receiver, he played tailback, he played fullback, he played tight end, he played outside backer, he played D end. I mean, just a complete football player and has tremendous ball skills. And is better than all that is a competitor he is. He's a phenomenal competitor.
phenomenal competitor. Can you talk about how quickly you guys moved on Freeman and secured that community? You know, Freeman goes back to a story that uh, two years ago I went down to watch a tailback they had at Miami Central. And went to watch the kids. The kid wasn't practicing. He was in night school. And so they were, Freeman was the backup. He started, he started repping in practice. Just caught my attention. A couple of runs, started watching him. Stayed there and watched him the whole practice. Got done, coach said, what do you think? He said, you know, what's, you know, the other young man's at night school. I said, yeah, I know. I said, but this guy here is pretty daggone good. He's a big thing. So I said, yeah, I'm telling you. I loved him. He had, and he ended up as a backup role, had about 600 yards. Came into our camp this summer. We knew about it. And I told Eddie, he said, yeah, I remember. He liked him. I liked him. We, he came back to camp this summer. And then uh, in our camp for about two days, worked his tail off, could catch, run, made people miss, did everything he could do. And we looked, and I told him, I said, I love him. He said, I do too. I said, well, take him. So we ain't, I said, I don't care how many, he ain't got no stars. He ain't have a star. And, uh, you know, you, you got to trust the value.